This is The Academy. I am Eli Ayala of Revealed Apologetics, and I will be bringing a six-part series on presuppositional apologetics. What is this called, The Apology Academy? It's just called The Academy. Okay. What's up, everybody? My name is Pastor Jeff Durbin, and you're watching Collision Today. I'm going to be interacting with an atheist on TikTok. So here we go. Unsupervised and unhinged. Welcome back to Cultish the Aftermath. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Me Anything. So you are watching Apologia Radio's after show exclusively for all access. Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church. It is our great pleasure to have you with us this evening. Uh, we have been doing debates here at the University of Utah for over 20 years, uh, mainly involving Dr. James White, uh, involving a number of others as well over the years. Uh, we have information on our congregation in the back. If you enjoy the work of Dr. White, he will be preaching for us uh, he'll be teaching Sunday school at 9.45 and preaching at 11. He'll also be preaching at Apologia's church plant in West Jordan. We're in Magna, uh, and Apologia has a table in the back as well. We're very grateful to Rossio Christi, the campus ministry that has worked with us to bring this event to you. Uh, they have a table in the back as well. We live in a day of sound bites, of memes, and very little substantive interaction with people we disagree. We live all too often in echo chambers. We are of the conviction that no one has anything to fear from the truth but liars. And that rather than shouting each other down, we need to actually listen and respond. And so we have been putting on these debates and we are very privileged to have our participants that we have with us this evening. These men are here without compensation. They are here as a gift to you. And so I ask that you show respect to both sides. I have asked that you refrain from applause or from any kind of disdain until the end when we can show our gratitude to all our speakers. We are privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Dean Chatterjee, he is faculty affiliate at the Oxford uh, Consortium for Human Rights the at the Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict at Oxford University. He is a Global Ethics Fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. And earlier, he was a senior fellow here at the S.J. Quinney School of Law at the University of Utah. We also have with us Chaplain Jared Anderson, he has an MA from UNC Chapel Hill and Masters of Divinity from United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. He has served as chaplain in hospice, prisons, and hospitals. He taught Bible for 13 years at UNC and at the University of Utah. He taught world religions at Westminster College. He is the founder and president of the Olam Institute. He is on the board of directors of the Humanists of Utah and the board of directors of uh, Salt Lake Interfaith Roundtable. To my left, we have Dr. James White. He is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. He is also a pastor at Apologia Church. He is the author of over 20 books, including Letters to a Mormon Elder, Is the Mormon My Brother? The King James Only Controversy, uh, The God Who Justifies, The Potter's Freedom, and many more. He has done literally dozens of debates here in Utah over the years, and it has been a great blessing to the church here. Uh, we also have Pastor Jeff Durbin. He is founding pastor of Apologia Church in Mesa, Arizona. He is also, uh, I forgot to get your specific title, founder of End Abortion Now. Is that? Head of End Abortion Now. Uh, and he has also been very gracious to us in the past. He and Dr. White spoke three and a half years ago in this room 
in another debate. And this debate was supposed to be the immediate follow-up, and COVID came along. But here we are, and these men have been very gracious to be with us. The question for us this evening is, is God necessary for ethics? The structure of our debate is going to be 20-minute opening statements from each side, followed by 10-minute rebuttals. We will take a five-minute break. We may bend that a little bit if there's too much of a crush getting into and out of the restrooms, but we will try to start as quickly as possible after the break. We will then have 20 minutes of cross-examination, followed by five minutes of closing statements, and then we will take questions from the audience. And since years ago, I literally had to pry a microphone out of someone's hand to try to get them to stop making a monologue. We figured out a long time ago, it's better to have you submit your questions in the moderator than go back and forth. Uh, if you have paper and something to write with, I will take those during the break. If you prefer to text me, you can text me at and I will announce that again at the break. But uh, we will have roughly 20 minutes of questions. They, the person, please specify to whom you are asking the question. It will be put to that side. They will have two minutes, and then the other side will have 30 seconds to give a response, and then we will move on. Uh, when we are finished with the questions, uh, then we will wrap up for the evening. There are restrooms in the back if you didn't see them when you came in. Uh, the ladies is on this side, the men's is on this side. Uh, we will be taking a break in just a little over an hour, but we will go ahead and get started. And so taking the affirmative to the question, is God necessary for ethics, uh, will be Dr. James White and Reverend uh, uh, Jeff Durbin. We will, uh, I will be timing both sides, but since there's going to be a switching at the lectern, I will be pausing the timing during the switch so that neither side loses time in that transfer. And so we will go ahead and open up with the affirmative, is God necessary for ethics? Well, good evening. I wish to invite you all to time travel with me this evening. We're going back to April 1945. We were traveling to a small town near Weimar in Germany. Captain Frederick Koffer is leading advanced patrol from the 6th Armored Division, a portion of the American forces driving into Germany. He is the first to come across the Buchenwald concentration camp located on a hill not far away from the quaint German town of Weimar. Together we stand before the barbed wire fence to look upon 20,000 emaciated, filthy prisoners, the survivors of the horror of Buchenwald. The world united to destroy the evil of the Nazi regime and only barely managed to defeat it. But tonight I have to ask us all here, what if the Germans had prevailed? What if they had managed to get the atomic bomb and use it in one of their V-2 rockets against, say, London? Clearly, world history would be completely different. But here is the question for us tonight. Would the horror of Buchenwald be any less wrong if the world never knew of its existence because everyone died and the people who perpetrated those horrors were victorious? We answer that question unambiguously and clearly tonight. Ethics and morality amongst mankind exist and can be known because men are made by God in his image. Every guard at Buchenwald was an image bearer of God, as was every victim. The guards and the perpetrators knew that what they were doing was evil from the start. They could not escape their createdness, nor the witness of the law of God written upon their consciences. It did not matter that they were doing the bidding of the current government in charge in Germany. It did not matter their leaders had been proclaiming the Jews and others to be subhuman. What they were doing was objectively a moral evil, and the context could not possibly change that reality. We live in a time where the numbers killed by the Nazis are dwarfed by the massacre of innocent preborn children 
in plain looking buildings safely tucked into our neighborhoods all across our nation. At the same time, our cultural insanity has overwhelmed us where we now allow eight-year-olds to choose their gender and then proceed to mutilate their bodies and condemn them to a lifetime of disease and dysfunction. We cannot even attempt to answer the question, what is a woman or what is a marriage, without being called a bigot or a hater. Serious consideration of morality and ethics has been replaced by emotionalism and a permanently established state of childhood all across the academic landscape. Challenge anyone's feelings and they immediately run for a safe space. Jeff Durbin and I stand here this evening to say unequivocally, Buchenwald was a moral nightmare, a clear violation of the standards God has built into his own creation. Likewise, the slaughter of innocent preborn children, the mutilation of born children, and the profaning of the covenant of marriage are ethical disasters and great moral evils. But to many who have been raised in public schools over the past decades, the immediate objection comes to mind, who are you to decide these things? What if you offend someone with your views? What if someone claims to be hurt by your position? Doesn't that make you evil? Aren't morality and ethics just human constructs that recent history has proven to be altered and changed by polls and elections? To these objections, we respond with clarity. Morality and ethics require a standard from outside the human realm. And that standard has been provided to us and preserved for us in the Christian scriptures. We do not flinch for a second at the trained response of the public schooled mind to such a claim. It has become dogma in our day that all religious claims are mythical in nature and are subordinate to science. It is even more outrageous, we know, to not only say God is required as the source of morality and ethics, but the specific triune God of the Christian faith. How exclusive. But of course, we do not even stop there. No, as audacious as it is in the early 21st century in the United States, we stand here this evening to proclaim to all who will hear, there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem, and because it once housed a beaten and broken corpse, but only briefly, and then gave up that corpse, the unstoppable power of new life, resurrection life. We now live in the light of that empty tomb. The one who arose is seated at the right hand of the Father on high, where he has been exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords. And this historical event, supernatural as it is, has changed forever this world and everything in it. It should be obvious to all of us that if indeed that tomb is empty, as it is, and if indeed that one who predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection not only accomplished these acts, but has ascended on high, we need to know how we must live in light of this history-forming reality. Do we just keep on keeping on, doing as we please, or must we seek to know what this divine judge demands of us? It is the Christian message that we can indeed know his standards and his law, and hence every moral and ethical system must be brought into line with that law. Long ago, one of Jesus' disciples, Paul, stood before the Greek philosophers at the Areopagus and uttered these amazing words, quote, Therefore God, having overlooked the times of ignorance, is now commanding all men everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will surely judge the inhabited world in righteousness by a man he has appointed, having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead." We must feel the weight of this announcement even this evening. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is provided to all men, including all of us here, as evidence of the fact that there is a day fixed when God will judge the entire inhabited world. All who have ever lived or are living or will live. He will do so justly in righteousness and he will do so by the one who lived a perfect life, gave that life on Calvary's tree, and rose again the third day. If judgment is so central to God's purposes as the scriptures reveal over and over again, then the standard by which that judgment will be made must be clearly known. And it is clearly known. I'm on a timer. I definitely need it. We know. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here and sacrificing your time and attention to this vitally important subject.
I want to personally ask you all to pay very close attention this evening, not only to what is coming out of our mouths, that is the claims that we're making, the things that are coming out of us, but what we are standing on or carrying into the debate. This debate this evening isn't summarized in the piecemeal arguments or attempts at particular um, evidences or claims made by either side. This debate is a collision of total life and worldviews. That is to say, both sides are carrying bags into this discussion. These bags are the underlying assumptions or presuppositions that come from our worldviews. They are either bags filled with cash that we can justifiably spend to purchase the emotions that we draw on when decrying evil or calling anything evil, or on our appeals to logical consistency we demand, or the necessary rules to have integrity and not lie to you in this debate, or the appeals made to human value and dignity. Just consider what's happening in front of us all right now. Our opponents, I think, are very brave. To enter into a public debate attempting to provide a foundation for ethics from their worldview. Here we have two men who are variously identified as devout atheists, humanists, who have claimed that there is absolutely nothing supernatural. That is nothing outside of the natural, physical, or material universe, who believe that humans exist on a continuum of purposeless, meaningless time and chance acting on matter. Human beings, according to their most basic ontology or metaphysics, are the descendants of bacteria and fish alongside other random results of evolutionary processes. We are bags of purposeless stardust, to quote Carl Sagan, one of their patron saints. Cosmic broccoli, as another atheist, Dan Barker, has claimed. Meat, bone, protoplasm, and a cosmos that doesn't care about us. They're brave bringing those bags in here, trying to justify and argue that their worldview can provide a cogent philosophical justification or warrant for their claims. They don't have the cash to spend in those bags, the cash necessary to make meaningful appeals to your emotions, to appeal to human value and dignity, to appeal to universal, immaterial, unchanging, and necessary laws of logic, or absolute and transcendent ethical laws. Absolute standards of morality or ethics do not comport with their view of the world and humans. Their worldview is bankrupt. They don't have the money to spend with you all tonight. However, they will make claims. They'll assume human value and dignity, the demand for honesty in this debate, the principle of induction, or the uniformity in nature to examine evidence and trust the basic reliability of sense perception, and they'll demand the need for consistency and holding to the law of non-contradiction. However, in doing so, what they'll be doing is sneaking their hands into our bags to borrow capital from the Christian worldview that they don't have. I want to encourage you to watch their hands this evening because stealing is wrong from the Christian worldview. Watch for the unjustified claims, the appeals to emotions that don't belong to the descendants of bacteria, the claims that contradict their most basic worldview assumptions. Watch them as they act like there are things that humans ought to do and ought not to do. Our esteemed opponents have agreed to show up to a fight without the worldview credentials to do so. Respectfully, you don't need Christian ministers to tell you that. Dr. Will Provine, the now deceased and renowned professor of biological sciences at Cornell University, a man who shared their worldview, he held the same bags as them, once said, quote, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposeful forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all. That's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either, unquote. Dr. Provine was correct. He was being honest about what his atheistic presuppositions lead to, although as an atheist, he didn't have to be. According to Provine, our atheist and humanist opponents don't have justifiable right to appeal to ethics in any meaningful or ultimate way. They have no warrant to appeal to any ultimate meaning in life, nor do they, given that they are simply cosmic accidents whose brains are just doing what their biochemical responses do under these conditions, have any philosophically coherent right to think that they are thinking in any meaningful way. They're just dancing out their DNA, as Dawkins has said. On the one side tonight, cosmic broccoli. On the other side, 
image bearers of God, of the true and living God, the only eternal God, human beings with value, dignity, and purpose, who reflect the glory and power of the triune God of Holy Scripture. Make no mistake, we are not neutral and neither are our opponents. We're not arguing for a general form of theism to justify morality or ethical appeals. As a matter of fact, we would happily join our opponents in refuting those other claims of general theism. We freely confess to carrying bags in here tonight as well. So what's in our bags? Our bags are filled with real value and philosophical currency. We have treasure to offer you. We are claiming that the Christian God revealed in Holy Scripture is a necessary foundation for justified true belief regarding all ethical claims. Without the Christian God, you can't prove or justify anything. Reject his revelation in history, and you become a fool, intellectually and morally. If you want certainty in the realm of ethics, you need Jesus, friends. Without him, salvation isn't possible, and without him, neither is knowledge. The claim of Scripture is that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God and his character are the necessary transcendent reference point for meaningful claims or appeals to ethics. God is the unchanging, eternal, sovereign God. He has revealed himself clearly and without confusion through the natural order, through his prophets and apostles in history, and supremely in the the incarnation, when the second person of the Trinity condescended, took on flesh, walked among us, lived the perfect, righteous, and truly ethical life that we have failed, died for sinners, and conquered death as a matter of historic record. The God of the Bible is the Principium. The Principium. His revelation is the reference point. He does not appeal to a standard outside of himself. His law is a reflection of his own eternal and unchanging character. Righteousness and justice are measured and revealed by him. Abandon that at your own philosophical peril. Abandon him and lose any meaningful or coherent appeals to ethical responsibilities or anything transcendent. All appeals to ethics, apart from God, as the reference point, are meaningless and incoherent. Let's take a look at an example. Just this week, a wicked and murderous woman who lived pretending to be a man named Audrey Hale went armed to a Christian school and murdered six innocent human beings, including three small children. We all feel the, the, great, the grief and the weight of that, including our opponents, atheists and Christians alike. The question is this, which side gets to grieve and complain in a justified and meaningful way? According to the Christian worldview, what happened in Nashville was murder. It was the unjustified taking of human life. God explicitly commands against this. You shall not murder, Exodus 20, 13. The law of God is transcendent. God is love. Scripture commands love does no harm to its neighbor. Those innocent children and those adults were made in the imago dei. They had purpose, meaning, value, and dignity. They were not cosmic accidents. Furthermore, the police officers who killed the murderous and wicked woman were acting justly in protecting the innocent and preserving human life by taking the life of that truly evil woman. What do we get when we look at Nashville through the lens of the devout atheist? What happened in Nashville was merely the scattering of protoplasm. One random result of evolutionary processes walked into a building and caused other cosmic accidents to stop breathing. So what? There's nothing above the Nashville shooter but sky, clouds, and vast emptiness. No justice is ahead of Audrey, and there is no absolute standard of justice to hold her to. You'll forgive me, everyone, for being so callous in this description, but we have to be honest about what atheist presuppositions give us. When human beings are absolutized and put at the center, then what happened in Nashville was absolutely, wasn't absolutely evil. No ultimate ethical law was violated in Nashville. Atheist Richard Dawkins explains, quote, The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. River out of Eden, unquote. The atheists and humanists will try to get around this glaring deficiency in their complaints about Nashville. They'll attempt to have you divert your eyes from the empty bags they're carrying. They'll claim what happened in Nashville caused pain, to which we should say, so what? 
Some random results of evolutionary processes like to inflict pain. They enjoy it. It makes them happy, and you aren't in charge of them. They'll try to avoid the glaring philosophical bankruptcy in their worldview, their ethical worldview, by claiming, we've decided as a society that we shouldn't cause harm, to which we remind them of societies run by Stalin, Hitler, Mao, and Pol Pot. They like to inflict harm, and you aren't in charge of them. Furthermore, if our esteemed unbelieving opponents believe that ethical obligations are based upon societal convention or the agreement of the masses, then we must remind them graciously of the time when in this nation society believed it was ethical to kidnap and enslave our black brothers and sisters, a sin and a crime, by the way, that God commanded capital punishment for. I want us all to remember that what happens in a godless universe just happens. It just is. When we absolutize human beings in their postulated godless world, what one human being does to another is ultimately morally irrelevant and illusion. Michael Ruse was right. In his essay called Evolution and Ethics and New Scientists, he said, in an important sense, ethics as we understand it is an illusion frobbed off on by our genes to get us to cooperate. Ethical codes work because they drive us to go against our selfish day-to-day -day impulses in favor of long-term group survival and harmony. Furthermore, the way our biology forces our ends is by making us think that there is an objective higher code to which we are all subject. Ethics is a shared illusion of the human race. So my friends, watch. We humbly ask you to watch. Watch as our friends write checks with their, wor their mouths that their worldviews can't cash. I thank you for being here. The question before us this evening, is God necessary for ethics? We'll now have a 20 minute opening statement from the negative side. I'm scared to speak here because according to Pastor Durbin, I'm a dangerous man, you know? So hopefully you'll find that that's not true. Uh, in fact, I'm honored and humbled to be here in this same podium with director, Dr. James White and our pastor, Jeff Darbin. And I thank my old friend, Pastor Jason Wallace of Christ Presbyterian Church of Magna, and of course, Rachel Christie for doing this event here. It's a great thing to do this debate and dialogue, that's how we expand our ideas and views, get to understand each other, and that's very important, and that's exactly what we're doing. So just one note of uh, caution, which is not, uh, per, per uh, Jeff Darwin, we came here to fight, you know, we didn't come here to fight. We came here to exchange ideas, to learn from each other, you know, because I believe that that's exactly how we enrich ourselves. So we're not here to fight. We're here to exchange ideas. Just want to let you know that. Now, time is very short for an opening statement. So many of the ideas that I'm going to give you, uh, they are in a very you know, constrained and summary format. I cannot explain them too much because there are so many internal intricacies and all that. Hopefully, down the road in the subsequent uh, time that we have, we'll get a chance to explain some of them a bit more but I would like to give you an overview, even though in a summary format, to get to show you where we are coming from, okay? Hopefully that will be helpful. The question of this debate is, is God necessary for ethics? Ethics. The answer to that is a resounding no. And let me explain why. Firstly, uh, when we make God the basis of ethics. And in this case, we have found out it's already a Christian God. That is what they're talking about. The question, of course, first is, there are at least 50 major religious sects, at least 100 or so, not so major religious sects, and maybe 200 or 300 minor sects and, uh, and then, uh, small religious uh, forces, uh, movements, all that. They all have their God. <clears throat> they all have their gods. 
Okay, so the question is then, which God are you going to go for? We did not find anything here to justify their idea of God other than they're coming up with their own God. The question naturally is of all these 300 or more so God, maybe there would be more gods and goddesses, which one should we go for? Which one should we talk? Now, if we say, no, it has to be our God. Our God is moral. We have to justify that with reason. Instead, if we try to do it by force, that no, it has to be our God, highway, my way or highway, then that is the end of morality. That's where we breed violence, intolerance, and that's not morality. So the moment we try to show that there is one particular God, as they are saying, that is to be preferred of all these other 300 gods or so, we need to find out why. We did not find any such reason here because there are so many gods, we know, we don't, we don't know what they stand for, okay. Then that's one big, big problem. Just it shows that we have to have something else besides to start with God. And that's reason, rational discourse, mutual understanding. Okay, the next question I would like to ask is, does, does such a God exist, whatever God we choose? And that's a very important question because now in this, in this case, we have already chosen a Christian God. We know that it cannot be rationally proved, meaningfully proved that a Christian God exists. Throughout the tradition, the Christian theologians, I can name all of them and their books and their ideas, no time for that. They have tried to give arguments to show that such gods exist because they don't want to show that their faith is a blind faith, it's a dogma, so they want to give reason to be respectable, to be acceptable. All those reasons fail. There are five main reasons for God's existence. They all have fatal flaws. They don't prove that God exists. So therefore, that's yet another problem. So we have to bring in something other than God. Now, then of course comes the veracity of scriptures. We have, we have seen that they have quoted from the Bible quite a lot, okay? Uh, how can we be so sure that if God, if, if the Bible, if the scripture contains God's words, well, how do you know that? The Bible, for example, was collected, put together nearly three, um, 2,000 years ago, you know, during a very primitive time by primitive folks. And Jesus, in fact, when he died after that, it was not for at least 40 years, the synoptic gospels were put together. During those 40 years, do you know how many ideas floated around? How do you know for sure those primitive folks kept Jesus' ideas exactly the way he spelled out and they're in the Bible, we don't know that. So therefore, this sort of blind faith in the scripture, that's not a very good idea either. So we have to bring in something else rather than blind faith and dogma, okay? So what are some of the fundamental ethical presuppositions? The ones I'm going to put here, everybody should agree, regardless of what, what religion or outside of any religion they stand. They happen to be, these fundamental ethical presuppositions happen to be autonomy of the individual, what we call agency. An individual cannot be a robot. To be a moral agent, that person has to have autonomy, okay? Everybody should agree with that. Then reciprocity, which we often call the golden rule. It's there in all religions. In fact, it has been there in human history, in all religions, way before Christianity came into being in Buddhism and all, all other religions. So in some form or other, the golden rules, the idea of reciprocity, respecting the other person as you would like to be respected yourself, okay? And then the question of responsibility. Can you think of morality without responsibility? So these are the fundamental presuppositions of morality. And these concepts are universal in the sense that in some form or other, different religions, different cultures, different folks, God believers or not, they all agree to some version of that. It's there all along. This is an empirical observation, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. But just because they're universal, they're not vacuous. Often universal statements are empty, they're vacuous. They're not vacuous, they're contextual. But often which are contextual, they could be, uh, could be, or could be relativistic. And morality cannot be relativistic. They're contextual at the same time, 
they're universal, they're not vacuous. It's a nice balance and tension in that, and that's the beauty of these moral concepts, that they are universally applicable in ways that people find suitable to them, but there are some basic core there, okay? Now, these concepts are related to the concepts of right and wrong, and these are central moral concepts, and these are secular concepts, right or wrong, whereas, if we bring in the religious idea of morality, that, that morality is based on God, then we get into this idea of sin and righteousness. Uh, these, are, these are religious concepts, and they're meaningful only to a bunch of believers, not otherwise, not, not to the outsiders. But morality cannot be segmented into the, these different groups, and because then it gets hopelessly relativistic. And so I'll get to that point just in a minute. Uh, so the whole idea is that ethics is essentially a human enterprise based on these concepts that, that I told you about and the difficulty of bringing in God that I mentioned a bit earlier. It's essentially a human enterprise. In fact, if I can quote a one line from Jared's statement, he's going to come up with after I finish. He says, the root of ethics is caring and cooperation. And caring and co cooperation are a feature of life. He's so right, you know. Uh, morality is from human to human, you know. We don't need to go up there and come down via that extra outside route, you know, in a way that is not needed. It's directly from one human to the other and human groups to other human groups and amongst themselves. That's where morality is, right here, not that way. That is cumbersome, okay? And of course, based on what up there, we don't know. I told you about the problems if we try to go from there. Now, so when it comes to sin and righteousness, these concepts, the religious concepts, they're only meaningful to <coughs> believers of that religion, but they generate guilt and shame and fear. Now, these are not moral concepts and they are very healthy, unhealthy, no question, but they are very useful in putting people into place, you know. Uh, they're good for controlling and they're good for manipulation, these ideas. And these are not moral way to do it, okay? So the point is that to believe in a God without any reason, it's a dogma. And a dogma which is not based on reason and open-mindedness human experience, meaning a meaningful dogma, that dogma is top down, not bottom up, like morality should be based on human experience, human life. And when that happens, that, that dogma is not good to base ethics on, okay? Ethics cannot be based on dogma. So this idea of my way or highway, you know, that generates tension, conflict, and violence. And history is replete with how uh, Christianity has led to violence all around. Uh, in fact, when it comes to violence, Christianity stands number one in the whole world history, followed a distant, a dist, uh, a distant follow, uh, uh, second is, of course, Islam. Anyway, I will get later on into some of the other traditions to show that there are really even religious traditions which are profoundly moral without a belief in God. Anyway, that will come later in our uh, segment later. Okay, so I would like to just simply uh, put myself down here now with this idea that uh, dogma should not be the basis of ethics, so we need to have reason. Now, the thing is that uh, God is a dogma the way it's put unless we bring in reason. But the point is this, a dogma can be reasonable. It is, it, the dogma is never rational, keep that in mind. But it can be reasonable if it's put to good use. If we can use it good ways to make, bring people close to morality, to make them more compassionate, kind, caring, sharing, and all those, you know? To that extent, the dogma can be reasonable, meaning it's helpful, but it can never be rational. So God could be helpful when it comes to morality but it can never be the basis of morality. Please keep that in mind. There's a big distinction between the two. Something that's helpful is always welcome, but let's not make it a dogma and make morality based on that, okay? Quite a few ideas. Some of them will be unpacked later. I'd like to leave it at that right now.
Thank you, Pastor Durbin, for spending your time arguing a version of our side. Um, makes it efficient. I don't know whether it's appropriate or inappropriate as the closing member of the opening statements to observe that this is an impossible debate. You should feel impressed that we are trying to pull it off. Are you not entertained? <laughs> Name the movie. You can believe that God is necessary for ethics. You can presuppose that God is necessary for ethics. We may have seen some of that tonight. But I believe it is functionally impossible to debate that God is necessary for ethics. Yes, we can reduce our definition of God so much that it becomes tautological and God becomes necessary for ethics. Okay, if God is whatever brought us into existence and existence is necessary for existence, then yes, in some minimal way, God is necessary for ethics. God is demonstrably real. You were not expecting that, were you? in that God is an idea that people, most people, actually believe in making God an intersubjective reality. Intersubjective should be the $20 word that you walk away with. You could also assert that humans are functionally God, a position that I support, but these minimal definitions of God cancel themselves out. If ethics are a human phenomenon, or more precisely, an extrapolation of social behavior of living creatures, then God is not necessary for ethics. The question of whether God is necessary for existence would be an interesting debate. The question of which conception of God is most ethical would be another interesting debate. The question of whether belief in God is helpful for morality would be yet another interesting debate. That's a debate I would probably be on the affirmative for, but that's not the debate we are having in this moment. I'm using morality to describe the system of belief relating to what is right and wrong and ethics as the analysis of that system. Either to establish or study it, ethics is the art and science of studying morality. We could also have robust debates about the ways that the idea of God and belief in God is problematic for ethics, which perhaps we'll get into a bit later. It is worth mentioning that God could exist and still not be necessary for ethics. Thousands of years ago, Plato asked, which is bigger, God or good? Is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? That's known as Euthyphro's dilemma. Even if you fervently believe in God, even if God does exist, God is not necessary for ethics. Only you need to exist for ethics to exist. We in this moment are enough. We being here having this debate means that God is not necessary for ethics. Here's how it works. You hurt them, now say you're sorry. Hopefully all of us have had an experience like this. Perhaps the person we hurt was a brother or a sister or a friend, but all of us have had the experience of being told that we hurt someone else, being told that our actions matter, that our actions impact others. Most of us have stories of childish cruelty that we need to grow out of. Anyone else burn ants with a magnifying glass? I'm sorry about that. Other actions are wrong because they weaken our character and are out of alignment with our goals like cheating. Being ethical means being a good member of society, being a good member of the groups we are a part of. Being a good person means that we act in alignment with the best interest of the well-being of others. What it means to be a good person is a conversation we all have. It is a conversation we inherit. It is a conversation we have throughout our lives. If you want to confirm that ethics are innate, just cut cake at a six-year-old's birthday party. God is not necessary for ethics because ethics are a part of life. Ethics emerge from us sharing life together. It is the task of a lifetime to understand that other people matter just as much as we do. Far too many of us never get to that point. Even though even toddlers can begin to understand that different people have different preferences. This is, there was a great experiment involving broccoli and goldfish. The toddlers could not understand why adults want broccoli. Ethics can be distilled to a single equation. Every action should be defensible to the ideal version of all those impacted by that action. Every action 
should be defensible to the ideal version of all of those impacted by that action. We should avoid hurting others because they matter the way we matter. If we have to hurt them, we should be able to explain and defend why we are hurting them, like there's a wasp on their head, or they're paying us to hurt them because we're their personal trainer. Ethics exist because you exist. If you don't exist, please do come talk to me after. Humans exist, we exist, we are talking about ethics. Again, ethics are a cultural conversation. We inherit social norms. We grow up with family traditions, some healthier than others. We navigate preferences and needs of our loved ones. All of these decisions and requests and conversations involve ethics. In the entertaining book, How to Be Perfect, Michael Schur, the author of the excellent show, The Good Place, reviews major ethical theories. I'm a fan of Aristotle's virtue ethics, which describes a balance of ideals that we should all strive for. I believe that all of our traits can be expressed in a healthy, virtuous way. Utilitarianism seeks the greatest good for the greatest number of people, which I feel is best balanced by focusing on well-being rather than pleasure. Deontology seems like a dodge to me, a fancy way of saying do the right thing, without necessarily explaining how to define right, but functionally the right thing is yet another intersubjective re reality established through intergenerational cultural conversation. Lots of very smart people have explored interpersonal ethics, which I am describing in my arguments. Emmanuel Levinas emphasized our basic duty to the other. Similarly, T.M. Scanlon's book, What Do We Owe to Each Other, emphasizes interpersonal morality, which requires that we be able to justify our conduct to others. John Rawls' veil of ignorance uses our self-interest to pivot towards what others want and need. Carol Gilligan's Ethics of Care also focuses on interpersonal relationships and our duty to care for others. Seems obvious when we talk about it, but applying these principles in our lives requires mastery and more self-awareness than most people prefer. When I was a believing Latter-day Saint at UNC Chapel Hill, I expressed my faith, bore my testimony to my then PhD advisor, Bar Ehrman, thusly. One of two things is true. Either God exists and God communicates to us through our physiology, psychology, and sociology, in other words, our brains, bodies, and groups, or God exists and communicates to us and we are created, evolved in such a way that we believe in God. Um, whether or not you believe we are created or evolved, our bodies and brains are, um, sorry, I will wrap up. As a chaplain, I affirm faith and spirituality and I work with people in the most difficult moments of their lives. I support people as they die, support people from any religious background or none at all. I am able to do this because I connect at the level of human needs and experience. Questions of meaning and the reality of connection and support are also human. God is not necessary for grief or support or resolution. We humans supporting each other does the work traditionally attributed to gods and angels. God is not here in this auditorium as best as we can tell. Many here may believe that God has an influence in this auditorium, but I hope that we can all agree that we are more certain that we are here than that we are certain that God is here. The presence of God is up for debate literally, but again, we can all be certain that we are here. We are here talking about ethics, therefore God is not necessary for ethics. Thank you. Some of you have begun texting me questions. It will make it a lot easier if you specify to whom, to which individual or to which side, the affirmative or the negative on the question that you wish it asked. Otherwise, I'm just gonna guess wildly. But uh, we will now have a 10 minute rebuttal from the affirmative and rebutting the negative. We just heard it said that only you need to exist to do ethics. So when the North Korean prison guard comes up to you and blows your head off with an AK-47, do your ethics vanish? And are his ethics therefore established as proper ethics because he continues to exist, but only for a certain period of time? 
You see, once you reduce this subject to, well, we're just going to, this is just us talking amongst ourselves. You have to deal with the reality that right now in North Korea, in China, unspeakably evil things are taking place. And they're taking place with the government saying, this is the proper ethical and moral thing to do. And in our own country, right now, in this state, in small little buildings in our neighborhoods, innocent little children are being torn apart in their mother's wombs. And this society right now, just in this past week, has demonstrated that when it is said that we inherit social norms, really? I can guarantee you one thing. The way that this nation has responded to what happened in Nashville is not how this nation would have responded to the same events when I was a young person, say, in 1975. Not even close. So what has changed? We need to be thinking about this because, to be honest with you, our society is coming apart at the seams. And once you say, well, ethics requires autonomy, that means we can come up with 350 million different systems of ethics because we, as autonomous individuals, get to just look at the universe and come up with our own way of thinking. You can't keep a society together like that, and that's not how this great nation was ever built. I can assure you of that. So what's the difference here? Well, you know, you have to, you know, if you're going to say God's required, then you have to figure out which God. Let me try this one more time. Listen carefully. There is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. You have to explain that. Islam has no empty tomb. Muhammad's tomb, everybody knows where Muhammad's tomb is. There is an empty tomb in Jerusalem, and you have to explain how the man who came out of that tomb predicted his, only, his own death, burial, and resurrection. When you predict your own death, burial, and resurrection, and then you rise from the dead, you get to tell the rest of us what to do because you are our maker. We need a user's manual right now. It's like everybody in our society has decided, you know what? I'm just going to I'm going to pick up my iPhone and I don't care how they designed it to be used. I'm just going to use it any way I want to. Well, it's not going to function very well that way because there are instructions. And without instructions, we're simply left with, well, you know, utilitarianism. We just we just want to do the the best thing for the most people. Except Stalin didn't do that. And by the way, if you say Christianity has been has brought about the most violence. <laughs> Stalin made that blew that that's that standard away a long long time ago. It's atheism that has brought the most violence to the world by no question on that level. Why? Because atheism says there is no god to tell us what is right and wrong, what is just and what is unjust. We need a standard from outside of ourselves because we are creatures. We are made in the image of God. The only reason that there is any kind of consistency in the moral and ethical systems around the globe is because we are made in the image of God. Read Romans chapter one. If you've never read Romans chapter one, I invite you tonight, sit down, read it, and sit back and go, how did that ancient man know so much about us today? He knew it because he was writing inspired scripture and has given us that standard from outside of ourselves. Well, I greatly respect the men, the image bearers of God to my right, and uh, I was saddened to hear Dr. Chatterjee say that he didn't come to fight. That's unfortunate. I did. Um, and that's because truth matters and it's worth fighting for. These are not just philosophical games that we're playing tonight. Uh, Mr. Anderson said that he talked about being at the bedside of people and grieving over people dying. He's borrowing again. I hope you caught it. He believes that his ancestors were bacteria. He believes he lives on a continuum of purposeless time and chance acting on matter. People don't shed tears when rocks tumble off a cliff and shatter. So he's borrowing. Dr. Chatterjee asked the question of which God? 
we answered that. He says we have to justify that, not according to his devout atheism. We did. We said that it was the Christian God, the triune God of holy scriptures, that apart from him, you cannot prove anything. Reject his revelation, you become a fool intellectually, morally. You have no justification for universal, unchanging, immaterial laws of logic and consistency. Are, are, are the descendants of bacteria obligated to hold to these immaterial laws? Are they universal? Have you ever smelled the law of logic? Felt one? Weighed one? Tasted one? If we believe that nothing is, there's no supernatural, as Mr. Anderson believes, there's nothing supernatural, then how do you get immaterial, unchanging, invariant laws with that worldview? No, not with their worldview do we need to justify anything or be consistent. With the Christian worldview, you do, because you have a God whose mind is the standard, who cannot lie, that is to say, he cannot engage in logical contradiction. So when we engage in the question of ethics and we are having this conversation expecting consistency, we have to have a standard underneath us, not just social convention and cooperation. This debate, by the way, isn't about the existence of God. It's about whether the Christian God is necessary for ethics. Dr. Chatterjee, when he started with that in his opening, challenging which God and we need to prove God's existence, he isn't in the debate yet, unfortunately. We'd happily debate that. We already have here. If they'd like to do it, we will. Uh, he announced uh, some standards. We have a foundation for ethics. We have autonomy. We have reciprocity. He said, the golden rule. I told you they were going to steal from us tonight. Responsibility. My question is, by what standard? It, it, is, it is always appropriate in a situation like this when you are talking to devout atheists and humanists who put the descendants of bacteria at the center to ask the question, by what standard? Is it Dr. Chatterjee's mind? Is it his likes and passions and dislikes? Is it the circle and community that he engages with? Wh where do we draw the circle? Do we draw it over Nazi Germany? Are they the circle we draw it around, or do we draw it larger over Stalin's Russia? Where do we draw the circles, and who's in charge there? Who gets to set the standard, especially considering we're just the descendants of fish in a cosmically indifferent universe? Never forget what bags they brought into the debates. Now, they just simply say, it's autonomy, reciprocity, responsibility. Listen, you can't just announce something in a debate like this. Just announcing it doesn't justify it. We need a justification, not just announcing it. Uh, it was said that we need caring and cooperation as the foundation of ethics. Caring and cooperation, friends, for the descendants of bacteria? Are we obligated to be caring and cooperative towards one another? Says who? Dr. Chatterjee? Mr. Anderson? Dr. Chatterjee says guilt and shame are unhealthy. Guilt and shame are unhealthy? That claim was made in a discussion about ethics in public debate. Guilt and shame are unhealthy. I say try saying that to the face of the rapist or the molester or the murderer in a court of law. Tell him that guilt and shame are unhealthy. No, it's very healthy. Guilt and shame are very healthy when we are morally responsible image bearers of God. It's absolutely necessary. He said, and I'll just go on the back of, Pastor James, you stole my thunder here, Christianity stands as number one in violence in history. Friends, that's laughable. If we just take some of the atheist regimes of the last hundred years, who do you want to look at? Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. And if you want to ask the question of comparative body count, they win by the ton. And so uh, the question, though, behind that is this. Why shouldn't we be violent? Do you see how he's pulling on emotions with his worldview that he doesn't have a right to? He says, the Christian church has been violent in history. My question is, what's wrong with violence? And Sir Anderson announces the utilitarian standard. He says, we need to have focus on the well-being of others and the pleasure of others. Again, it doesn't do any good to announce the utilitarian standard, just to simply claim it. You can say that human beings like well-being. Okay, that's nice. They like pleasure. Great, that's, that is the case. Utilitarianism. They like well-being, they like pleasure. Just because that is the case that humans like that doesn't mean it ought to be the case that we pursue it. Do you know who disagreed at times? Hitler. Do you know who disagreed? The Green River Killer. Do you know who disagreed? All the serial killers of the last 20 years. How'd Ted Bundy feel about that? Brothers and sisters, friends, 
pay close attention to their bag. We'll now have a 10 minute rebuttal from the negative towards the affirmative. I never said that Christian religion is the most violent, most violent and destructive force in human history. I never said that. I said Christian religion of all religions is number one in historical violence. There's a big difference between these two statements. And I said that Islam, also a religion based on God, it comes a distant second. Anyway, so I hope I'll be quoted right. Now, what I hear from the other side, from our very uh, respected and honorable speakers, is nothing but arguing in a circle, you know? They're talking about how great the scripture is by citing scriptures. They're talking about how great God is by simply affirming that God exists, you know? We have to go a bit beyond that. And what also they're doing, they are putting the non-believers, atheists and humanists and liberals and others, you know, in the group of all the worst form of human life that we know in history, like Stalin, Mao, and Hitler, and all that. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way at all. That is to go beside the point, you know. Uh, surely uh, those individuals, no uh, moral uh, humanist who claims morality would go for that and try to defend them. So I think that was a non-starter, and that's beside the point. Uh, <clears throat> humans are purposeless, we have been told, they evolved out of worms and bacteria. Of course, we should believe in science. I'm a firm believer of evolution that doesn't make us the humans without any aim and purpose. We all are autonomous human beings. We are depending on the education we got, depending on our influences. We have definite purpose in life. The question is in what direction that purpose is directed to, you know? So those are the important questions. It's not that humans are simply floating creatures, you know, out, uh, uh, evolved out of fish, and therefore they are just simply floating, nowhere to go. It's not that way at all. Look at, I mean, we're all human beings. We're not quite like that at all. We have definite purpose. <clears throat> okay. And uh, this idea, again and again, we have brought in this idea of whether we are pro-life or pro-choice, you know. Why can't you be both pro-life, which I am, and pro-choice at the same time. Am I pro-birth? I dare not say that. That's the choice of the woman. That's her decision, you know, that's to be done, decided between her and her doctors and others. But it doesn't hurt to be pro-choice and pro-life. We all have to be pro-life, no question. Uh, resurrection, you know, we have been told about resurrection and what that tells us. Again, it's a question of faith, you know. We have to have some more justification, some historical account, and some reason to talk about these sort of scriptural proclamations. Otherwise, we are simply going in a circle. And in fact, I would say, if I can say, that Jesus must be then turning in his grave right now to hear all these things. Anyway, so I would like to just make one or two comments, which is that this way to divide any, anybody or any people, those who don't believe in their idea of religion and their idea of God, uh, as sort of something bad and evil about them. Uh, that is the division religion, God believing religions like theirs routinely make, the division between the sacred and the profane. If we're on their side, everything is sacred and nice, but otherwise if we question them and on the other side, then everything is profane. It's not that simple, it's not that simplistic, it's not that way at all. In fact, that simply creates more divisions, which they would not like to uh, promote, and that's exactly what they're doing, you know? So that's not how to go. And I would say, if we look at some of the world's great religions, which are not Christian religions, uh, but in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia, we find that there is a very inclusive idea, not the divisive idea of sacred and profane, but the idea, inclusive idea of the secular as sacred, which brings things together, and there we find tolerance and diversity and understanding and appreciation of each other, and of course, empathy and compassion. 
For example, Buddhism, uh, much earlier than Christianity, is a prime example of a very high order moral system based not on God, but on rational moral psychology, you know, something like the one that we have not found since then. And we can talk about those things based on human experience and reason. That's the beauty about Buddhism. And it's a very high order of ethics, most compassionate and most nonviolent of all religions, except the one that's Jainism. That's even more so. I don't have the time to get into all the details of these religions, okay? Then when it comes to also monism, that takes you beyond God, if that's possible, but that's exactly how many of those traditions are, because God is a human creation. In fact, we have been talking about our God the Father and our divine judge, you know, uh, that is anthropomorphic. That's a very primitive idea. But these ideas we find in other religions, you know, they take you beyond God, which we call monism, you know, but I don't have the time to explain that concept, you know. Uh, and if I try to, maybe that will not go well with them. It will, they will miss the idea. Anyway, uh, so Jainism, then we have Taoism, Confucianism, uh, all these ideas in the East, they didn't, they had the profound moral systems, but no God there. In the West, for example, great moral system of Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics, the ancient Greeks, on which the Western civilization is founded. They didn't have their Christian God, and what a wonderful system they gave us. And then, of course, even today, look at that. The secular ethics of statecraft, which is our US Constitution, wow, gives you goosebumps to talk about the Constitution that's absolutely secular. No reference and mention of God at all. And that has been the one that's guiding us for all these 200 years, in spite of all the turmoil and everything, and there's no mention of God there. So only two brief comments I'll make, which is that, as I said, God need not be relevant for ethics. God could be extremely helpful and important. It cannot be the foundation of ethics. If God could be of help, then it's what we call, uh, a, a, in fact, a faith that is reasonable faith, you know? So something could be reasonable without being rational. And uh, so um, God, I'd like to bring in God vis-a-vis -vis business. You know, this one respect, especially by God, is extremely helpful. That's in business. Organized business is a big business, foolproof business. Thanks to God, you know why? Because to my knowledge, nobody has ever come back from the dead to ask their tithing back, you know? And when we have that idea, business thrives when people cannot come back if their product didn't give them what they wanted, okay? And I would like to make a dis distinction between fantasy and illusion. Uh, God is a fantasy. The idea of God is a fantasy. Uh, it can be very helpful, you know, as a fantasy, if it helps us, even though it's not out there true in real world, and if we believe that it is there, then that's an illusion that hurts us. But if we take it as a fantasy, meaning that it's not there, but nonetheless we use it to help us in a nice way to bring in more morality, more understanding and harmony and all that, that's great. Fantasy could be very, could be very helpful. For example, Christmas, you know, we know that it is not true that on the 25th of December, Jesus was born. He was perhaps born late in April and us also, nonetheless, Christmas, what a wonderful celebration it is, celebration of life. It's a great time, joyous time. We all get together, even though we know that it's not true that Jesus was born at that time. That's a fantasy, but that's very helpful. Santa Claus, even kids know that Santa Claus doesn't exist, even though what a nice fantasy it is, Santa Claus. So my point is that if kids have their Santa Claus, why can't God, why can't adults have their God? Thank you, Pastor Durbin, uh, for saying that just claiming things is not sufficient. Um, and therefore, I want you to all join me in the sacrament of conversation and to practice what is called epistemic humility. And as we move forward in our question and answer session, I think it will be very helpful to remind ourselves what are we discussing. Um, the proposition that we are discussing is, is God necessary for ethics? 
there's been a lot of um, presuppositional enthusiasm about the Christian God. Um, I have an answer for what happened to the empty tomb, if you want to bring it up um, in the questions. Where does meaning come from? I am protoplasm who cares. Um, we could put that on a t-shirt. And what is bigger than, what is bigger than us? This group is bigger than us. Once again, objective reality is reality independent of what we believe. Like disease, the Black Death does not care what you believe in. Subjective reality is real because of what you believe. There is nothing more urgently real than a broken heart. And then intersubjective reality is the reality that we create together, and that is where ethics lands. This is The Academy. I am Eli Ayala of Revealed Apologetics, and I will be bringing a six-part series on presuppositional apologetics. Defending the faith is super important, and I'm excited to be able to participate in helping equip you to do that effectively and biblically. In my series, we're going to be unpacking all different aspects of the presuppositional method. What makes presuppositional apologetics different than other approaches? How to answer objections to the presuppositional approach? What is the role of the authority of scripture? What is the role of theology in defending the faith? All of these things we talk about and more. We try to bring it up a notch and not giving you completely introductory material, but kind of digging deep into the ins and outs of this method. I am looking forward to equipping you and participating with you and training you uh, to be better defenders of the Christian faith. We're now going to move into a 20-minute uh, section of cross-examination, 20 minutes for each side. We're going to begin with cross-examination from the affirmative to the negative, and then we will follow that up with 20 minutes of questioning from the negative to the affirmative. So we'll go ahead and start our 20 minutes now. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here with you, and I honor you both, and thank you so much for, for being here with us and doing this. Uh, if I could ask you this question to respond to the quote that I had in my opening statement from Dr. Will Provine, the professor of biological sciences at Cornell. He says that because of his views of modern evolutionary biology, it tells us loud and clear, and these are Darwin's views, that there are no gods, no purposeful forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be all completely dead. That's just all. That's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. Could you respond to Dr. Will Provine, given your worldview? Yeah, I, I agree with the beginning of that. Um, I do personally believe that um, when we die, our consciousness most likely does not persist. Um, I would comment on the ultimate versus greater, because I think that's very, very important. It is true that questions of meaning are not objective or absolute, and that is an amazing, wonderful thing. Because again, that means that each of us is able to determine what is meaningful to us and what is important to us. I honor the fact that for many here, Christ and the Bible are guidelines for meaning and purpose and ethics. I celebrate that. You need to be very, use the Bible very carefully. Um, but that is not the case for everyone. The, the important thing that makes it greater than us individually to answer some of the questions as far as like, aren't there just billions of points of view? Well, yes, there are billions of points of view. But again, we are all part of the conversation. And so in response, yes, even if there is no life after death, even if there is no absolute meaning, that means that there is life before death and there is meaning before death. Mr. Anderson, I don't think you answered the question, so I'll ask it again. Please he do. Says, he says there's no ultimate foundation for ethics given your worldview. Yes. No ultimate meaning in life and no free will for humans either. You say that um, it needs to be meaningful to us. It's at least meaningful to us. Um, was it meaningful to the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway? Was, was his determination of what was meaningful for him just as valuable or meaningful as your 
perspective that he was wrong? Uh, meaningful is different than defensible. Um, I work with murderers and pedophiles all the time. I have a least favorite pedophile. Are they he's wrong? Very, he's very annoying. Yes. They're they are, absolutely wrong. They are absolutely wrong. Or said, they, are, they are technically intersubjectively wrong. So they're not absolutely wrong? Um, no, because it's you. all a conversation. So the debate's over, friends. They are intersubjectively wrong. So, so you admit, Mr. Anderson, that they are not absolutely wrong. The Green River Killer is not absolutely wrong. Ted Bundy is not absolutely wrong. Child rapists are not absolutely wrong. And you came to debate that your worldview provides a foundation for ethics? Yes, um, the humanist perspective does provide a foundation for ethics. Because again, um, rape is wrong. Murder According is wrong according to the cultural conversation that we are all of which apart. So if a society draws a circle around themselves and says that you can kill and cannibalize other human beings, as long as there are a large enough society that draws a circle around themselves and they determine that it's right, it's right to eat other humans? Some cultures have believed that, yes. That and okay? they, they are part of the conversation. Is that I, ethical? Depends on the context. So killing, killing and cannibalizing other human beings could be ethical in your system. If you're frozen after a plane crash and our soccer players, no, perhaps. No, I, I think you missed it, Mr. Anderson. I'll say it again. Killing okay. and cannibalizing another human being could be ethical so long as you have enough people that agree with you. That's not what would make it ethical. It would not be the agreement. It would be the conversation and the navigation and the negotiation. So, for example, a mercy killing would be an example of ethical killing. Because again, the best version of that person would agree. In my ethics class in divinity school, I argue that the second best version of serial killers want to be killed. So that's a common ground that you and I have. So Mr. Anderson, um, given what you've just said, why ought we to love our neighbors rather than eat them? Because that is what they prefer. And that is part of the cultural conversation. And yes, all of these groups should be part of the conversation. And I think we should be horrified by what Mao and Stalin and Pol Pot but have you've done. you've already admitted, Mr. Anderson, that there's no absolute above Mao or Stalin or Pol Pot. So no, why there's... should we be, why should, well, let me finish the question. Sorry. Yes. Why should we be horrified when there is no absolute standard to hold them to? You've already agreed that if they decide as a culture and community that what they did was right, morally right, then they're right in your system. And there's nope. no complaint. Because the victims would not agree, and the victims also have a say. The victims, you believe, are descendants of bacteria. Yep. Thank let, you. Let, let me ask, and, 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 your side had made the indication, at one point it was said that the Greeks gave us this great civilization. Um, let me point out that Alexander the Great not only enslaved millions of people, but in his battles in basically conquering the known world at that time, killed uh, millions of people as well. And so by what standard do you say that the Greeks gave us a great civilization and at the same time say, yeah, except they also enslaved millions of people and killed millions of people in the process. Is there anything outside of what you call a conversation whereby someone like Alexander the Great can be actually be judged. Okay, I, I guess it's directed toward me. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, it's directed toward me, so let me respond. You are making a caricature of our statements, you know, so you have to listen to us carefully, please. I talked about Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, I named them. I did not mention Alexander the Great. Of course, he can show us other things too besides killing that we can emulate, you know, his valor, his courage and you know, all that. But at the same time, I would not, I did not talk about him. I said that the Western ideas of justice, civilization, those ancient ideas, uh, our traditional ideas are based on those ancient ideas that we find in Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics, you know, I brought that in, and they did not have Christian God at that time, you know? So that's what I wanted to say. So therefore, what you are saying is not quite right to put that on me. And also, secondly, uh, uh, well, I can stop there, of course, uh, and then I can go on other things, you know? Right, right after you, you made that statement, this will sort of help me to, to clarify what I was asking. I was talking about the consistency of the worldview of these systems, you, I believe, said that the Constitution of the United States, did you say, 
is totally secular? It is a secular constitution, yes. Secular constitution. So when you look at the authors of the Constitution of the United States, and you look at how they interpreted their own words in regards to the value of human life and things like that, you don't think it's important to recognize the, the prevalence of the Christian worldview that formed the language they used? Um, I'll, I'll comment first really, really quick, if, if I may. Um, I mean, most of the founding fathers were deists and Unitarians. Um, I really like Thomas Jefferson's conversation around separation of church and state, and I think Thomas Jefferson is a poignant example um, of the struggles of human goodness, because of course, he owned slaves, he had children by his slaves, and he also was one of the authors of this beautiful aspirational document. Um, Mr. Anderson, uh, you mentioned separation of church and state. Uh, when Thomas Jefferson mentions that to, in reference to the Danbury Baptists, he mentions the separation of church and straight, state. Where did that doctrine of the separation of church and state come from historically? I mean, I know that, a, as you said, that the documentation was, was in that letter. And then, of course, there's the First Amendment, you know, that well, protects you, our right you, to worship. Are you aware of where the doctrine, the historic doctrine of the separation of church, of church and state comes from? I'm not sure, but, but please tell me. Are you, are you aware that it comes from the Covenanters, the Huguenots, the people who believed in Lex Rex, that the law of God is transcendent, and that the government has to obey God in their sphere, and that the church obeys God in their sphere, and therefore they are separate institutions, both obligated to obey God? I'm saying, are you aware that the separation of church and state is a Christian doctrine? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you also used the term epistemic humility. Uh, could you differentiate between your utilization of that phrase, epistemic humility, and a basic statement of agnosticism toward whether God can or cannot speak? So in other words, if God has spoken historically, what kind of evidence would you actually accept that he has spoken and has given us the norms for ethics and morality? What would you accept as evidence? I love that question, thank you. Um, so I think a starting point that we all might be able to agree on is that God is bigger than us. Maybe? I know it's not our turn yet, but um, if God is bigger than us, so like let's say if God exists and God is bigger than us, then we cannot fully understand God. And so that I, I am a devout agnostic, certain theist. Um, I am a devout agnostic because I take seriously that we as human beings do not know everything. Um, I actually do believe that God exists. Um, I believe that we function as divine. I believe that God is an idea that billions of people believe. Um, so yeah, done. You have, uh, you said on a webcast that I was listening to that you've actually created your own pantheon of gods. Is that true? I, I'm honored by the investment. Yes, um, I have. Uh, personified my highest ideal, which is elegant, efficient approaches to well-being. I have them illustrated, they're very pretty. So doesn't that demonstrate that you recognize you need something higher than yourself to have ethics and morality because you're creating deities that, that illustrate these things uh, in Absol your own experience? Absolutely, and I'm so glad that you used the word higher than yourself because I completely agree Dr. Chatterjee agrees, like we do need things that are higher than ourselves. And one thing that I wrestle with is that religion has done incomparable good at inexcusable cost. And I think it's a really important conversation to have. Um, thank you, Mr. Anderson. So you refer to yourself as a devout agnostic. So that would mean that you're devoted to the, to the idea that you don't know. Yes, and it means, it means that in each situation, I am not the expert on you. I am not the expert on what's right for you. I am not the expert. So as a chaplain, I meet people where they are. I listen carefully. We are all and forever mystery. What happens in a lot of relationship arguments is that, so we all have invented versions of the people around us in our head. And then we get mad that they do not fulfill, you know, like, I can't believe you did that. That's because they don't correspond with the invented versions of them in our head. Instead, I am devoutly agnostic and we are all forever mystery. And I say, wow, that really surprised me. Will you teach me about yourself 
so that I can better love you and care for you? Well, I appreciate that answer. But the question was, devout agnostic means you're devoted to the idea that you do not know. Yes. You Thus, the epistemic humility. So epistemic humility. Do you have epistemic humility with the pedophile? Um, or do you know that it's wrong? It is, it's more important what their victims think. Um, I am not, like, it is... Well, let me, Mr. Anderson, if I could put it this way. Let's say that you and I go out to dinner afterwards, okay? Be happy to. And, um, and while we're at dinner, at dinner together, somebody breaks into your vehicle and um, urinates on your seats and takes your car stereo. There's still car stereos. So specific. They take out the computer. <laughs> I'm trying to make this as ugly as possible. <laughs> I'm trying to make it as ugly as possible, Jared. Will you have epistemic humility with the thief, or will you call the police, assuming there's an objective standard of morality they violate? Okay, you said about five things in that question. So, like, yes, I would call the police. No, Why? there is not objective reality because this is the social contract and the social agreement. So again, society is bigger than us. That's all that is needed so for us to have an ethical really, they conversation. They haven't really violated any standards, and justice isn't really necessary. It just makes you uncomfortable considering the societal convention that is developed. No, it does demonstrable harm. So? That is part of our agreement. Then it, like, he, doesn't, I, he doesn't agree. So what's your answer to him? Pre preach the gospel of humanism to him. He doesn't agree. I probably have met him in prison. Um, and I, I, again, I have had, um, so the, the great thing about ethics versus morality is that we can have an educated conversation around why pedophilia is wrong. We can also have a conversation why marital rape is wrong. You know, these are very, very important conversations to have. So and of let me, course, let's try that since we're on a time here, uh, yeah. Jared. Um, why is pedophilia wrong given your worldview? I'm, again, I'm glad you asked. Um, it's because of the power dynamics at play and the developmental level of all those involved. If a yes is, if someone cannot say yes, a, or if someone cannot say no, a yes does not count. And I think power dynamics need to be taken very seriously Excellent. when it Are comes you, to intimacy. So, so you believe the power dynamics is a, is, a, is a foundation for this. Someone has to be able to say yes to what's being done to their body yes. in your system. Are you pro-choice? Yep. Yes. So in relation to the developing human being in the womb, they can't say yes. They are involved in that power dynamic where somebody is taking the life of a human being in an unjustified manner, but you believe that that's appropriate. It's appropriate. Might for rights is okay in abortion. No, not at all. Um, I mean, one of the issues that we have in our country is that corpses have more rights than women. Um, because I, I deal with donor services all the time in the hospital, and I cannot take your organ even if you are dead. Um, and so when, it, I mean, abortion is an important issue, and I think that we should do all that we can to minimize abortions. Why? Is it wrong? Um, it's problematic and it's complex, and I think that we should be given as many options as possible to make the best choice for everyone. Um, it, was, it was said earlier, and I think it was Dr. Chatterjee, he said that he's pro-life and pro-choice. Yes. I'm trying to, I'm trying I would to put myself in the same category. Okay. So... This is a debate on ethics. And if what you're saying is your conclusion is, I can be both sides of a life and death issue, doesn't that demonstrate why you need to have something outside of humanity to give us the standard by which you can be saved from this schizophrenia? I mean, saying you're pro-life and pro-choice at the same time is, is a, is a, it's a self-contradictory statement. Do you eat meat? Um, yes. We are all pro-life and pro-choice, all of us. But Mr. Anderson, do you recognize the distinction in the Christian worldview that sees the difference between 
image of God in humanity and animals and creatures and beasts. Are you calling me a Christian? I mean, I'm, I can... No, but I'm saying in the Christian worldview, there's a distinction between what is the image of God, something very special in humanity that elevates humanity above all other creation. It makes it unique. You, dis, you so strongly desire that, and I sense that. I've listened to hours of your talks and podcasts and everything else. I'm so flattered. And I sincerely appreciate you. You're a very kind and gracious person, but you recognize that humanity is something, has something distinct about them, but your yeah. worldview doesn't comport with that. In your worldview, we're just uh, fish that became philosophers, bacteria that evolved through purposes. We are, and we are more fish that became gods. In my, in my world. But that's meaningless because it's a fictional God. It's not a God that has any really essence of a God in your perspective. Changes the world. I mean, it's very real. In an arbitrary manner, though, correct? No, not arbitrary. In a defensible manner. Okay, let me ask Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. Dr. Chatterjee, I want to get you involved as well. You mentioned uh, numerous times that, um, that uh, you kept appealing to rationality and reason in your discourse. And here's my question to you, Dr. Chatterjee. Given your worldview, are we required to hold to immaterial, universal, and unchanging laws of logic this evening, considering the fact that you are, a, as you've said before, a devout atheist who believes that we evolved from the scum? I don't see the question. I don't understand the question. Could you please repeat that? I mean, sure. we're drawing I, something from something else. Are you know? we required to hold to immaterial, universal, and unchanging laws of logic, given that you're an atheist who believes we've evolved through purposeless, unguided forces from bacteria? Why ought we to be rational, given your perspective? Firstly, I'm a, I'm a humanist. So is Mr. Anderson. And I don't know why you are not talking about all the wonderful aspects of humanism, rationalism, and atheism, rather than being obsessed with pedophilia and serial killers and worms and what fish. I don't understand. So broaden your perspective, okay? I mean, this is the idea that you lump everything in the worst possible way and you think that that's what we are, we are you know? Of course, none of us, we support Hitler, Mao, or whoever, you know, uh, Stalin, all that. But Dr. Chandler, well, you don't time, see that we're showing that you share the same worldview as these men. Time was actually over before Of, of course question. not, I don't see why. If you'd like to answer then, it, you're welcome okay, to, right, but sure, yeah. the time is over. So, yeah, can we, then we can ask now, our questions. Yes, now it's 20 minutes of questions from the, uh, of cross-examination from the negative to the affirmative. By the way, uh, there were some questions about my accent. I have to let you know that I have been living in Utah for a long time, so I have had this slight Utah accent, you know? Uh, and, uh, so, and at times it's hard to understand Utah accent, but better get used to it, you'll get it, okay? So, okay, so my question is this. Uh, look, as a humanist, rationalist, I do not believe in dogma or fairy tales. Of course, I do not believe in heaven or hell and no life after death. Does that mean that therefore I have no meaning in life? I mean, you are drawing sort of absurd conclusions out of something that, 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 that doesn't even warrant, you know, that conclusion, you know. Surely, rationalists and humanists are full of purpose, full of meaning in life, you know, but there are reasons for that. And we have to get into those ideas, okay? And so therefore, my question will be, why is it that you believe that simply holding on to your faith and especially believing, uh, putting even children into that faith early on to get them brainwashed and not letting them develop with curiosity, imagination, empathy, and critical thinking, along with wonder, all these great qualities that helps to develop a child's mind you are just getting it closed by holding on to this one view. But if you'd like to hold on to that one view, I would like to find out some reason why you believe that is Christianity. You have not given us any reason, let alone why it should be God in the first place. And then if it's God, why it's the Christian God? There are lots of steps. You're omitting all those steps, you know? Uh, I should admit one thing in that We've context. Gone, gone two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a, that's, that's a very, very long question, but we, we have given you a, a great deal 
uh, the, the last question that you struggled with is one of the clearest examples of this. That is, you say you're a rationalist, why should you believe these things? And we ask you, why should we tonight in this room, all of us be using laws of logic to answer questions and to evaluate responses? In your worldview, you can't give us a reason why, on pure, purely naturalistic presuppositions, why these laws of logic exist and why we all recognize that we need to be utilizing them. And so that's the fundamental thing. You, with, without the Christian God, you're just left going, well, you know, yes, I am a, evolved, I'm, I'm just evolved, but I have purpose and you just have to believe it. And we're asking why. And then I also have multiple times pointed out that as far as the Christian God is concerned, uh, we have an empty tomb in Jerusalem. And so there is a fundamental claim that Jesus made as to who he was and then proved that by his resurrection. And that then becomes the foundation of being able to say it's the Christian God that has the right to define these things for us because he's the one who made us. And if I could answer, Dr. Chatterjee, you, you bring up the, the, uh, the claim of uh, Christians have dogma, Christians brainwash. And, and I, I would hope that it'd be clear to every rational and thinking person that everybody on this stage has dogma, doctrine, and we all teach. The public schools have dogma. They have doctrine. Your system has dogma and doctrine. It's not the question of whether we have dogma and doctrine, it's which dogma and doctrine is actually in accordance with the truth. You ask the question of why would we brainwash our children in the Christian faith? Uh, why would we teach them things like empathy, love, why wouldn't we talk about things like beauty, truth, goodness, knowledge? And I'm going to say, Dr. Chatterjee, because apart from the biblical worldview, all of those concepts have absolutely no meaning. Without the Christian worldview, there is no true love. Without the Christian worldview, there is no beauty. Without the Christian worldview, there is no foundation that satisfies the preconditions of intelligibility necessary for science, for logic, for ethics, for truth, for beauty, for goodness. And so we talk to our kids about these things because they're the truth. And so I, I know you use the word brainwashing, but it really comes down to we're all teaching who's teaching something that's in accordance with the truth. Can I just respond? Look, uh, why do you believe that love, empathy, good ideas, meaning in life, all those things, you have to be only a Christian to have that. What about the whole big world? Christianity is just one tiny part of it. But if we believe that way, you have to give some reason. You're simply repeating yourself going in a cycle. I don't understand no, I appreciate that. that. Now, let me, let me try to make it clear. I did, I did have it in my opening statement, so it, perhaps you, you missed some of it. But what I said in the opening statement is I provided a justification or a philosophical warrant for the claims that I was making, and I based them upon the triune God of Holy Scripture. He's revealed himself in nature through prophets and apostles, and ultimately through the incarnation of Jesus Christ in history. In other words, Dr. Chatterjee, the Christian claim is that God has spoken. And the claim of Scripture is that apart from the Christian God, if you reject him, you become a fool intellectually, morally. And apart from the Christian God, you can't prove anything. I'll give you one example, Dr. Chatterjee, so you can see what I'm aiming at. When we challenged you to provide a foundation or justification for why we should be rational given your worldview, you haven't given one and you can't give one in your worldview because your worldview is a naturalistic worldview where all you have is matter in motion. The laws of logic are immaterial, invariant, universal laws and truths that we're all supposed to be holding on to. The Christian worldview can provide a foundation for those concepts and those truths, but your system cannot. So reject Jesus and reject the laws of logic. Reject Jesus and reject science, the uniformity in nature, the principle of induction. Reject Jesus and say things like, it might be okay to eat your neighbor rather than love them. Well, I have the highest respect for Christianity, Christian God, but I don't like people being close-minded. If we believe that way, I would like to see some reason for that because there is a bigger world outside of Christianity. I didn't see any reason why we have to confine ourselves to Christianity. Give some reasons. In fact, I perhaps I can give you more better reasons as to why Christianity is such a wonderful religion. 
that, that than what we have been hearing from you. Let me cite one thing, okay? Well, Dr. Look, Chatter uh, if I could answer that, Dr. Chatterjee, when you say there's so much more outside of Christianity, if Jesus was who he claimed to be, then what could be outside of Christianity? He's described in Colossians chapter 1, For by him were all things made, whether in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, or authorities, all things created by him and for him, and, and he is before all things, and him all things hold together, that they consist. So if Jesus is actually the incarnate creator, what could be outside of him? That's the whole point. We're saying we have, our creator has entered into his creation and said, this is how you live. This is how you have, have life. So you have to say Jesus had to have been wrong. You, you literally have to make an epistemic claim that Jesus was not who he claimed to be to say there's something outside of the realm of his authority. I have, I have a follow-up question. How do we know what Jesus said? We have the records given to us, not only, well, let me just point out, we, we keep, I did hear a, a little misunderstanding. When we talk about the Christian faith, we're talking about everything from the beginning of Revelation in, with Moses all the way through the New Testament. So we're not just talking about the New Testament, but how do we know what Jesus wrote? Well, you ought to see my debate with uh, Bart Ehrman on that subject. Have you seen that debate? Did Jesus write anything? Uh, no, he did not write anything as far as a book that's been passed down to us, uh, but his disciples provided to us those documents. Yeah, no, we, we have multiple traditions about what Jesus said and did. I'm asking you, what are your criteria for evaluating them? When you say multiple traditions, please define what you mean. Um, I mean, the synoptics versus John, so we have the sayings of Jesus. Well, I mean, I'm going to bracket a question, which is what does Christianity have to do with the debate? Is God necessary for ethics? But I'll, I'll just put that aside since this is the conversation we're having. Um, so we have Jesus' words and actions in Mark, and then we have them in Matthew, and then we have them in Luke, and then we have them in John. Um, so how do you, I, I'm genuinely curious, you know, like how do you evaluate what, so did Jesus say every single thing that's mentioned in all of the gospels? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. How and in fact, you know? in fact, in fact, for example, I taught through the synoptic gospels for nine years in the original languages. And uh, there is, there is no uh, conflict between the synoptic tradition and the Johannian tradition as to uh, who Jesus was, uh, what he taught. For example, uh, just one, one glowing example, since you said you studied under Bart Ehrman, uh, he likes to try to uh, introduce a contradiction between the Synoptic Gospels and John as to the day of the crucifixion. Uh, that is easily demonstrated to be completely false. He does not understand uh, that, the, uh, that the Passover was a, a week-long feast. And just on a basic, basic level, Dr. Ehrman makes numerous basic errors on those levels but he doesn't allow anybody to correct him because, well, he's Bart Ehrman. Yeah, which, which textual tradition do you feel is the most accurate? I'm just curious. When you say textual tradition, uh, even, even Dr. Ehrman has admitted, we know what the New Testament originally said, we're just playing with little details. Um, and so when I debated Dr. Ehrman on this subject, I asked him, uh, can you show us any place in the New Testament where you do not believe that we continue to have the original readings? He pointed us to one word in Second Peter, as I recall, that had absolutely no meaning uh, as to doctrine or anything like that. So the reality is, uh, I, I think uh, in that debate with Dr. Ehrman, he said that the New Testament is by far the earliest attested work of all of antiquity. Um, and he's right about that. So it uh, doesn't matter which, whether we're talking Byzantine manuscripts or Alexandrian manuscripts, that nomenclature actually has now been pretty much debunked by CBGM. But uh, it doesn't matter which manuscripts we're using. If you use the Textus Receptus or you use the Nessiolan text, same gospel, same teaching, same message that we're delivering this evening. Okay, pick, thank you. Quick devotional pivot. Um, what are your thoughts on interfaith cooperation? I have no idea what that has to do with our subject this evening, but... Um, it's, it's ethics, which means that each religion has its framework of ethics. You, you have claimed to be Christian supremacists. What? You have demonstrated that you are Christian supremacists. Yes, which, that, 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 Jesus, that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Yes, okay, if that makes you a Christian supremacist, okay. Well, you, 
I mean, you have said that- I'm gonna make that a t-shirt, Jared. You should. <laughs> okay, you, no, you get, you get Christian supremacist. Do and we I'll have to get, give you any money for that? That's meaning, what I, that's meaningful what I want protoplasm. <laughs> oh. Protoplasm with a purpose. Uh, there you go. We'll make those two out of this debate. Can, can I just make a quick point, okay? Well, I just, if I could, Jared, can I answer a little bit of that? Please, yeah. Here's, just take this as, you know, something as, okay, if, if it's true, Jesus claims that he was God in human flesh. He received worship. Jesus forgave sins. Uh, Jesus showed power and creative control over his own creation, walking on water, healing people, raising a little girl from the dead, raising him, Lazarus from the dead, raising himself from the dead. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If that's true. I don't okay, believe any of just, it is, just but granted, right. Granted as a hypothesis, okay? If it's true that he is God in the flesh, that he is the eternal God, that he's the Savior, and he says he's the only way to God, if someone believes that, does that make them a Christian supremacist? Yeah. Well, it, it depends on what their belief, this is why I asked, because it depends on their belief about other religions, because there are multiple paths. If Jesus theories. says, I'm God, and it's true, let's just, again, take it as a hypothesis. Yeah. It's, let's say it's true that he is actually God, and then someone comes along and claims that he isn't God, when it is the case that he is God, is it wrong to point out that they're wrong? Depends on what your purpose is. But if it's true that he's God, and they say that he's not, and it's actually true that he is, if someone says, you're wrong, is that showing epistemic humility? It is time for your questions to them, so. One, one sorry, one, I know, one follow-up. Sorry, I'm, I'm asking sorry. questions. Now. Yeah, Should one, one, okay. one follow-up question then. Can people worship God without knowing? Can people worship God without knowing? Yeah. Well, the scriptures teach that all of humanity, this goes to some of the things that Dr. Chatterjee, you've been saying as well, like there's all these other people, all these other religions, all these other gods. The scriptures teach that all of us are made in the image of the same God. There's only one true and living God. And that we all know the same God. Which scripture are you talking about? Well, if I could just finish. If we all know the same God. The problem isn't that we don't know this God or that there's a lack of light or evidence. The problem is, Jared, Dr. Chatterjee, myself, James, we're all sinners. We're all rebels. And what we end up doing, Dr. Chatterjee, to get to these other religions and all these other conceptions of God, is that we don't want to know the true God because we hate him, because we're rebels against him. So we switch him for gods that look a lot like us. You mentioned all these other religions. When you study these religions, you'll see that those gods look a lot like us. Like in Mormonism, you were a Latter-day Saint. You know that the God of Mormonism, Elohim, uh, he became a God one day, just like we will through exaltation. He had a God before him who had a God before him, a body as tangible as man's of flesh and bone, and that he has sex with his goddess wives to produce children just like us. Their gods look just like us. The Christian God is distinct because he is not like us. He is, like you asked for, something that is transcendent and above us. But the problem is, is that we don't want the true God. We know him, Jared, scripture says, but we don't want him in our knowledge, so we suppress the truth about him. And I would just say this with love towards you, gentlemen, that suppression is coming out so clearly tonight in your desire for love, your desire for justice, your desire for truth, but you have a worldview that just militates against those concepts with every statement you make. Um, I think I hear projection, but I, I like really, really, really quick. You'd again, have to demonstrate that tonight you make a lot of claims, but no, no you, justifying, no we, warrants. We, we, I'm, we I'm have a, yeah, we have a framework of conversation. You are the one who has a framework for fighting. But um, I am genuinely curious what your approach to interfaith cooperation is. Can you describe what you mean by that? Like, what, give me a little more broader. Between what faiths? For example, I've done many, many debates with uh, Muslims. No, not 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 debates. Service. Well, like, but, but my point is, I've done many, many debates with Muslims, and in those debates, there are issues that we would agree upon as monotheists. So I don't think that's what you mean by cooperation. Um, Ibu Patel has the Interfaith Youth Corps, and that would be an example of something that I. Um, that I'm talking about. So do you value with your worldview, um, let's say there's a flood, you know, so like all, which there very well might be in, in the month or two. Um, do you value all of us coming together, no matter what our beliefs are, no matter what our worldviews are and coming and very, sandbagging no, 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 together? Thank you, Jared. That's a better yeah. explanation. So um, 
do I appreciate and am I thankful for image bearers of God acting like image bearers of God in moments of crisis and those sorts of things? Absolutely. That, the question, though, is being able to justify what they're doing. So when the atheist shows compassion, love, and mercy and gives of themselves to help, say, flood victims or tornado victims, I'm so grateful because they are imaging God the whole way through. Their worldview, however, doesn't comport with what they're doing. Their worldview doesn't provide the preconditions necessary to actually do what they're doing in a meaningful way. So, for example, the Christian worldview says, image bearers of God, this is a fallen world, this is a tragedy, this is broken, this ought not to be so. From the, from the atheist perspective, this is just cosmic accidents being stirred around on a, so, so quick, on a cosmos quick, that doesn't care. Quick follow-up. So... You just said that they don't line up with their worldviews, so you're more an expert on others' worldviews than they are? You said tonight that you do believe that you're descendants of bacteria and fish. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving you your worldview, and I'm telling you the implications of it. No, I'm talking about interfaith cooperation. So like atheism is one thing, but if a Hindu has a religious reason to serve, if a Muslim has a religious leader to ser reason to serve, if a Buddhist has a religious reason to serve, in your worldview, are they expressing their imagio dei, um, like their, their divine nature, yeah. according to their own religion? No, I think, I, I think that's a good question. I think I answered that in terms of everybody knows the true God. It's a problem with the suppression of truth. And so all the expressions of idolatry or false worship are because of the fundamental problem of humanity, that we're sinners and we rebel against God and we switch God for idols. However, this is important. Because you said this tonight, like somehow we were vilifying you. We're showing you your worldview, but you guys are in the image of God. You could throw a coin into the mud, and it could be marred and covered in dirt, but that image hasn't been lost, and it hasn't been lost in you gentlemen tonight. It's, it's, it, the image of God is still there, but you cannot provide the preconditions necessary or the justification for the claims that you're making tonight. That's the point. Then you weren't listening, but I appreciate that. <laughs> We, we, still, we, we still have a uh, little less than a minute. One quick point. Uh, I didn't mean to say that all biblical prophecies are wrong, that scriptural uh, ideas don't make any sense. I didn't quite get to that point in case you thought so. Uh, look, I started believing the biblical prophecy after I saw what happened in Colorado and in the state of Washington. The first ratified uh, the uh, same-sex marriage. Then they also ratified uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, cannabis uh, this uh, marijuana law. Okay, so that that's legal for recreational purposes. Okay, and that made me more convinced about at least one biblical prophecy, which is that if two men share the same bed, they should be stoned. You know, so we have this. Historical. That's that's not a that's not a prophecy. That's a that's a law. I'd like to be able to. to they okay. went they went at least okay. three minutes over at one point. Biblical, so. biblical law. <laughs> biblical law. Uh, it's now empirically verified. Yeah. So many years after the Bible, you know. So I'm convinced there's some truth in the Bible. Yeah. From the beginning of human history and redemptive history, there's been a conflict between light and darkness, the children of God versus the father of lies. It goes all the way back to Abraham versus his culture, Moses versus Pharaoh, David versus Goliath, the prophets versus the unfaithful, and Paul versus the philosophers. This collision, this antithesis has existed from the very beginning. And it's important for Christians to recognize the duty that we have before God to proclaim the truth and to take down every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God. We're commanded to have a reasoned defense for the hope that's within us. And so we need to be ready to press the antithesis to be part of that collision. Let's get started. Uh, we now have closing statements of five minutes each from both sides. Once again, starting with the affirmative.
Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for being here with us tonight. I do greatly appreciate it. Very, very much. Thank you. So, where do we go from here? Because, from my perspective, I mean this with as much humility as possible. The debate was on whether God is necessary as a foundation for ethics. Jared admitted that there's no ultimate foundation for ethics. Do you hear that? No, nothing ultimate. Nothing absolute. He even, and, and this is just because he's being consistent. I'm not chastising Mr. Anderson for this. He was just trying hard to be consistent, though with his worldview, he has no obligation to. He was trying to be consistent when I challenged him on the question of a murderer, a serial rapist, a pedophile, and he admitted in the cross-examination, go back and listen to the tape. This will all be up so everyone can review this and go through it and listen to the arguments. He admitted that murderers and rapists, molesters, are not absolutely wrong. He even admitted that with his worldview, it could be right to murder and eat your neighbor so long as enough people agree with you and you've created a culture that does that. Friends, brothers and sisters, the debate is over. The debate is over. You have two gentlemen here that I honor who are made in the image of God who are not just bags of meat, bone, proto protoplasm. They are not simply cosmic broccoli, as Dan Barker has said. They are in the image of God, and you watch them up here tonight doing what Scripture says they would do, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, wanting desperately what they could only have in God, what they could only have in God, and yet their worldviews do not comport with what they're doing, with what they desire. The problem is the problem of human sin. And this question of ethics, you know, we're talking about Scripture, God's Word, being the very foundation for ethical absolutes and obligations. Go back to the opening statement, friends. What did I say? I said the Christian God, the triune God of Scripture, has revealed Himself in history. His revelation is not in secret. It is in natural revelation, something that cannot be missed. The heavens declare the glory of God to the degree that Scripture says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That it is that obvious, it is that clear, that God has made himself known to all of us. He's made himself so known to us and so clear to us that even tonight, you had men who desperately cling to what they can only have in Jesus Christ. Goodness, truth, beauty, moral absolutes, justice, all those things. They talk about violence as though it's a bad thing. That was the image of God. And I told you in the opening, very humbly, I said, watch their hands tonight. Watch how they sneak their hands over to the Christian worldview to borrow capital that doesn't belong to their worldview. This is not a question of whether Christians and atheists can do moral things. That wasn't the topic of the debate. The question is which worldview can justify provide a coherent foundation to appeal to morality and ethics at all. You heard from the atheist side tonight, the agnostic side tonight. Um, by the way, agnosticism, it means A, without knowledge, A, gnosis. How many knowledge claims did Jared make up here tonight? He's a devout agnostic. He doesn't know, but he says he knows a lot of things, makes a lot of claims. And so you can see the internal uh, contradiction that happens constantly at every turn. The question is, which worldview can justify the appeals you make to logic when dealing with ethics? The appeals you make to ethical absolutes. However, I have to say, I'm, I'm kind of in a jam here, and I mean this very humbly. When I say let's provide a justification for absolutes from our respective worldviews, he admitted there, is, there are no absolutes. There is no ultimate foundation to ethics. And so we have a debate, debate tonight where what you've seen is that the Christian worldview can provide you the reference point, the eternal, unchanging character of God that is the foundation, that provides the foundation and justification for ethics. And you have the admission tonight before your own eyes and ears that atheism or agnosticism with its rejection of Jesus Christ can provide no ultimates, no absolutes. The issue tonight for all of us, for all of our ethical failures, is our need for Jesus Christ. That's the end. He mentioned sin and uh, he mentioned guilt and shame as a bad thing. Friends, guilt and shame is very important. 
And the problem with us is our ethical problem. We've sinned against a holy God, and the only answer is repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, who saves sinners. And Dr. Chatterjee, he can remove your guilt and shame as well. The, the topic of the debate is, <clears throat> is God necessary for ethics? Instead of getting into this debate, the two of us, and maybe some of you too, we have heard a sermon, a Christian sermon. It was not a debate. We wanted something more than that. We wanted to get them out of their box to hole and get into responding to people with a broader perspective than repeating their same dogma and belief again and again. You know, my point is that not only ethics, but life should not be based on dogma. And Christian God or any God for that matter that we know of, uh, which are anthropomorphic, they're made in human image, you know, okay? And that is human creation. If the, if the triangles would have had their religion, I'm sure their God would have had three sides, you know? So anyway, uh, so it, I wanted, I expected something more than this. Go ahead, Derek. One thing we all agree on is that we have failed at this debate. And that is because we've been having different debates. In fact, this wasn't a debate, except in structure. Christianity was not the topic of this debate. Jesus was slipped in. I think he'll forgive us. Um, it would have been nice to spend some time on common ground. Morality is greater than each of us. Even if ethics is not absolute, it is bigger than us. It needs to be defensible. It is the conversation. Every religion has its answers to what is right and what is wrong. Each of you, I hope, have your answers about what is right and wrong. And now you are invited to this conversation about ethics. Whether or not we believe in God, we can all be ethical. Whether or not we believe in God, whether or not we believe God is necessary for ethics, we can treat each other well. I know I speak for Dr. Chatterjee as well when I say my priority in this debate has been not only to debate ethics, but to model respectful ethical behavior in a debate about respectful and ethical behavior. Thank you. We are running over on time, and so I'm gonna cut the questions a little bit if that's acceptable with everyone. Um, the, one, uh, the format of the questions, I'll ask the questions. Uh, the, the person or the side to whom they are addressed has two minutes, and then there's 30 seconds for the other side. Um, how, about, if, how about we do this one minute? Two minutes is a long time. Two minutes was what was in the, was what how, was agreed. How about we do one minute, guys? Okay. I'm, I'm good. Get them done fast that way? Yep. Okay. okay. If, if you're agreeable, there's one question that was asked more than any other, and it starts with the negative side, so we can go back and forth. Is that acceptable? Uh, people are dying to hear. How do you explain the empty tomb, Mr. Anderson? Joseph of Arimathea moved his body. Um, I, so what happened is I believe that Joseph of Arimathea was a sympathizer of Jesus. I believe Joseph of Arimathea was um, someone in power. Um, the more status you have, the closer your tombs um, were to Jerusalem. And so what would have happened to the crucified, um, you know, those crucified would have been, they would have been thrown into a mass grave. Um, and Joseph of Arimathea did not want that done to Jesus. And so Joseph of Arimathea went out on a limb and he had um, Jesus put in his own tomb. Like, I think all of this is very historically cred credible. Um, um, as I alluded, I did PhD training in New Testament studies. And then Joseph of Arimathea had himself a very nice Sabbath. And at the end of Sabbath, which was Saturday evening, he went and he asked his servants, hey, could you move that body out of my family's tomb? Thanks. And I think his servants buried Jesus somewhere. And I would love to know where. Response. And so the tomb was empty when, G when um, his disciples found it. Like that is, that is a valid tradition. Um, and fascinatingly, Mark uh, 16, Time. really quick, Mark 16, 8 says, the women didn't tell anyone anything because they were afraid. So super interesting. Uh, for the affirmative, 
Uh, do I get a response? I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm just getting yes, old. I, I would. Uh, I would. I would like to. In, yes, in, please. In Thirty seconds. Of course, there's nothing historical about that at all. It's pure speculation. You have Jesus's own prophecies, his own statements to his disciples, which they were shocked about. What do you mean? That far be it from you that this could ever happen to you. You have all of these things. All that has to be now be made up and fictionalized on the basis of pure speculation for which we have absolutely nothing in a historical sense to substantiate it that. That's what you just heard. Okay, question for the, for the affirmative. Uh, how do you respond to the charge that what you're offering is simply circular reasoning? You're assuming your conclusion. Very good. Um, any question about ultimate foundations has to be ultimate. Right? So someone says, I don't like the fact that you're appealing to God as the ultimate foundation. That seems very circular because that's the nature of an ultimate. It's just that, ultimate. If, if something claims to be an ultimate and then appeals to something outside of itself to verify itself, that other thing becomes the ultimate. So for example, if I challenge the atheist um, uh, to give me a, a, a reason that reason is, is necessary, what are they going to do? start giving reasons for reason as necessary, but they haven't provided a foundation for rationality or reason in the first place. They're going in a circle, but a vicious circle because they haven't provided an ultimate foundation for reason in the first place. An ultimate is just that. Philosophically speaking, it is ultimate. If it appeals beyond itself, it is no longer the ultimate. And scripture says that God is the ultimate, the reference point, the foundation. And scripture says that if you deny him, if you deny his revelation, you become a fool and you cannot know anything. These men tonight showed that they don't know anything. They have no justified true belief. 30-second response. I still hold on to my idea, my claim, that I see nothing but the circular reasoning, you know. You're bringing in all these ideas, but your basis is based on faith, and from that we are deriving all these things. Go beyond that to justify what you were saying. Otherwise, it's arguing in a circle. Yeah, in just a few seconds, the Bible was produced by the same kind of conversational human thinking that this conversation is and every conversation is. Uh, we have a question from um, someone with cerebral palsy. He is in a wheelchair. His question essentially is, if uh, society determines that he is a burden on society and he should be removed from that society, does he have a right to say that society is wrong to kill him? He has absolute right to say that. I don't know why any society, unless it's totally barbaric, is going to say that, yes, society has a right to kill that person. So I don't see any reason why it should be, in fact, matter of debate. It's understood and any rational, humane person with a minimum sense of ethics would agree to that. Yeah, and the person who is most impacted has the most voice. Well, we heard it announced tonight, the utilitarian standard that we should work for the, the well-being and the happiness of the greatest number of people. If, if you use the utilitarian standard, the greatest uh, happiness and greatest well-being for the most people, then it is right when society says this person is a burden and removing our well-being and our happiness, it is right according to their standard to execute them because it infringes on the well-being and happiness of the most people. If you are somebody that's seen as a parasite in a society, like say, for example, the Jews in Hitler's uh, Germany, then it is right, according to that system, to say we can execute you because you're a parasite or a burden. That's their standard. Pastor Durbin, you are making a caricature of utilitarianism as you have been making caricature of the rational and the uh, humanist perspective all through the, all through the evening. You don't understand utilitarianism, nor do you understand deontology or virtue ethics. Okay. Question for uh, the affirmative. Uh, why are most wars done in the name of God? And they said, including the wars by Stalin, Hitler, and other leaders of genocide as well. Why would God require man to do this? The scriptures say to not be violent. Jesus preached peace. Please, please explain. I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what the question is, is saying because Stalin wasn't, wasn't engaging in a religious war. Well, let's put it this way. 
atheism is religion. So it was religious on that on that level because he had an ultimate ultimate authority. But if you're if you're if you're talking about most wars, um, if you're talking about the political wars after the Reformation or something like that, those were due to the relationship of church and state. You had church and state uh, unified together, and so you had uh, battles and wars related to to that that most definitely violated Jesus's teaching. Uh, but so did the connection of those those things and the establishment of all sorts of sy systems of authority that Scripture never ever provided for. So, um, but putting that together with Stalin and stuff leaves me wondering exactly what the what the question is all, all really all about. Also, if you indict Christians in history for sinning in some way, there must be some ultimate standard that they're violating. Right. Thirty second response. Yeah, the question was a standard question against some religious presuppositions. If there is a kind, loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God, as the Christians claim, then why there is so much evil in this world, including Stalin, Mao, and others, for which the Christians don't have any answer? Okay. Okay. Uh, please, please. Please, I know it's getting late, but our speakers, very gracious to be here. Please show respect to all. Uh, last question uh, is to both sides. I'll give each side one, uh, one minute. If I find that my life uh, is no longer worth living, is it wrong to kill myself? And starting with the negative and we'll end with the affirmative. So one, one minute. Um, I work with suicidal people all the time. Um, I myself was suicidal for over 20 years. And I'm very grateful to be alive. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, the problem with suicide is that it ends all possible versions of you. And I do believe, like I work in hospice, I work in people, I work with people who wonder why they're still alive. And I do believe that I am supportive of death with dignity. Um, so I do believe that for someone who is in pain and suffering and cannot imagine any possible better version, that yes, that is defensible. Now, that said, we need so much more support. Like I hope, I, I look forward to working with military veterans and others. We need to support people as much as possible so that that is not the best option for them. And one minute from the, uh, for the positive. Do you hear it again? We need to, we ought to, human beings, uh, they matter, they're, they're worthy. Do you see the image of God pouring out of Jared tonight? I love it. It's delightful. And it militates against everything he believes fundamentally. Here's what he believes. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no, no free will for humans either. In a Darwinian evolutionary model, that's the perspective. And I want to say, if you want to lead somebody to purposeless, meaningless, and to suicide, give them Darwinianism. Give them Darwinianism. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. You have no value Nothing. You are in a cosmos that doesn't care about you. I can't think of a better system to lead somebody to suicide than that. In the Christian worldview, it is absolutely wrong to kill yourself acting like you have no value, no meaning, and no purpose because you fundamentally do and you can't escape it. You are in the image of God. You are made to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The problem is sin, and the solution is Jesus. The only way to heal the heart of a person who is who is determined to, uh, to commit suicide is to give them the gospel and connect them to the grace of God and Jesus Christ. Pastor Durbin, you like, you sound like a broken album. I think the debate's over, Dr. Chatterjee. We have reached the end of our evening. Please take, uh, please join me in thanking all our speakers for being gracious and being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, such an energy. Yeah, thank you. I am honored.